Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming to this session on unlocking India's urban code. Um, and we'll probably devote a large part of the discussion on the smart cities program in India. Uh, so before I start, um, are people, is everybody in the room aware of the smart cities program? Because I'm going to quiz you on it. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I heard Mr. Bajaj saying that any city with smart people in it is a smart city. <laughs> um, okay. Um, we'll have a wide-ranging discussion. What we'll do is we'll start with some opening uh, comments from the panelists. Then I have a bunch of questions. And then we'll open the uh, discussion out to the audience. And hopefully, all of you will participate. Uh, it's being uh, web streamed as well. Um, OK. So the Indian government announced the Smart Cities program in 2015, 2016. Um, it's a five-year mission covering 100 cities, uh, with 20 smart cities being chosen every year. Um, these 100 cities will be distributed across all states, and each state will have at least one smart city. For the first year of the challenge, states selected cities following a round of selection, and the top 20 cities were selected by the government of India. Now, obviously, there's a financial incentive to this, and that's what makes it attractive for the cities to participate, be selected as smart cities, besides, obviously, the tag of getting the smart cities themselves. Now, to discuss all of this, we've got a wonderful panel. Uh, we've got Ajit Gulabchand, who's the chairman, MD of HCC Infrastructure, but most importantly, one of the people in India who's actually attempted a very serious urban experiment. Uh, we've got Pratik Agarwal, who's the CEO of Sterlite Power, Amit Jain, the president of Uber India, and Jagdish Mitra, who's the chief strategy officer of Tech Mahindra. So Jagdish, why don't we start with you? Just a couple of opening comments on what you think about either urban, smart cities, what role technology plays in all of this? Um, sure. Uh, I think, um, you know, first of all, um, without going into the definition of smart cities, because I'm sure that can take more than an opening line of two minutes uh, and has very different perspectives depending on where you, what you're focusing on. Um, so from a Tech Mahindra perspective, we do a lot of work around technology. But the Mahindra group overall, uh, we have a view on smart cities and we're doing some work around it. I think it probably needs to be more thoughtful cities planning than smart cities. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we'll get to smart. Um, so my opening remarks are really about how do we create the thought process within the city to make sure we at least get the basics right, which to me is uh, you know um, electricity, which I'm sure Pratik will talk about, um, water, um, security, and transportation. These are the four things. And the common comment that I'll make, because we do some technology work with uh, UK, US, and other cities as well, uh, is that it's got to be a very different view in India than what the rest of the world is. So we'll have to learn and do things for India than what works else, elsewhere. OK. Um, I'll come back to you. But you know, I'd, I'd also love to touch on this. And maybe, Ajit, you'll touch on this. Because we live in a country where people believe India lives in its villages. So urban almost comes as an afterthought to anybody, when in fact, actually, the pace of urbanization is picking up dramatically, and nobody's prepared for it. So hopefully, we can come to that. But Pratik, a um, couple of you know, two minutes worth of opening comments from you. So firstly, thank you for having me here. Uh, as I was walking around uh, the conference yesterday, a few people, one of my friends came up to me and said, uh, Pratik, you're speaking on smart cities. So what are smart cities? And uh, every time I came up with some creative uh, definition of smart cities, knowing very well that I didn't actually know what the real definition was. So I woke up this morning and I Googled it. And I found the definition of smart cities uh, on the Indian website. And I'll read it out to you. It's just a couple of sentences, right? So smart cities focus on their most pressing needs and on the greatest opportunities to improve lives. In the approach to smart cities, the objective is to promote cities that provide core infrastructure and give decent quality of life to citizens. The four priorities are water, electricity, uh, affordable housing, broadband connectivity, and environment, the five priorities, sorry. So that was, I, I just want to take your attention to two things. The point here is to improve lives, and the point here is quality of life. The smartness of the city is a means to an end. And that end is improving lives and quality of life. And I'd like to argue today that India does not need a smart city program. 
India needs a, a mission to get these five things, water, electricity, affordable housing, connectivity, and environment on an agenda, and it needs economic incentives to get there. And once you create competition and economic incentives, then people use smartness, which is technology, et cetera, to achieve those five goals. So you don't need a mission as smart cities. You need the, uh, these five things need to be the mission. And I'll just take a quick example of the success stories in India. We have an airline industry that is flourishing, that, that provides impeccable quality of service, some of them at an incredible price. And that didn't happen because there wasn't a smart airline program from the government. That happened because a sector opened up. It allowed global capital to come in and people to fight with each other to deliver quality of service to the Indian citizen. And I believe that's what we need in the delivery of electricity, water, broadband uh, in India. Thank you. OK. Again, you know, maybe I can just ask you to just mull over this. But you see, the problem is the Indian government can't let go of its instinct to plan. So there is no notion of providing the basic public goods and then letting the market play it out. Right. But it wants to actually get in the way and plan things for the future, predict the future, if you will. Yeah. So if you could just think about that angle of that as well. Um, Amit, um, you know, this obviously, um, it was flagged that mobility and transportation is a big part of uh, the whole smart city program, or it should be a large part of it. So f sitting at your perch at Uber, how do you view this? Yeah, thanks, Ruben. Uh, I think as we think about you know, smart cities, and as you talked about, Ruben, urbanization, I think for us, transportation, uh, given that's the area that we're in, is absolutely a key critical of how we think about uh, the future of smart cities. It didn't seem to be one of the five, uh, five pillars, but uh, I would add that as a sixth pillar if it wasn't because we're absolutely passionate about how we think about transportation. You know, we are sitting here in, in Delhi, we've got the dubious distinction of sitting here in one of the most polluted and congested cities in the world. Uh, as, as urbanization continues to increase, over the next several decades, there'll be over three billion people that'll move to cities across the world. How do we keep pace with our transportation, our infrastructure, and how do we provide mobility solutions that are better than where we are today. So we are at a point that we can only go up, and how do we increase from here? Uh, you know, as we think about some of the areas that, that, that I'll touch upon and focus upon, you know, what do we do in today's infrastructure environment using technology of today to make a change today? We can talk about public infrastructure. We can talk about public transport. A lot of those things takes planning. A lot of those things take time, tens of years, billions of dollars. What can we do with technology today what can we do with the cars that we have today? You know, cars, as you look at it, is probably your second most expensive purchase after the house. It's utilized at 5%, sits in your home or sits at work, and makes our cities look like parking lots, make, and moves our cities like traffic jams. How do we use our assets today? How do we use our technology today to get more people in fewer cars? How do we have ride sharing? How do we have our same assets today but get more people ride sharing for both commercial as well as private cars and reduce the number of cars on the road even if the number of rides increase and using technology to do that. How do we use technology to get the signals back from the cars that we have to help our urban planners plan better? Where is traffic higher? Where are there potholes? Where are you jerking suddenly because there's something in front of you? How do you use that data back to help our urban planners plan better and if we don't start doing it today, it's, it's difficult to imagine what our cities will look like 10 years from now when they look like parking lots today. Perfect. Ajit, yeah. either you can talk from your experience or just more general perspective on urbanization. <clears throat> urbanization has been a fact of India for s centuries or millennia. In fact, all civilizations have been centered around cities. Nobody has been centered around a village or a, some kind of farm. India had continued to ignore their cities because it created a romantic idea of a village, which was nothing but a filthy place of ignorance and poverty. But we created, romanticized it. And most of those who romanticized it lived in cities in comfortable places. And therefore, we continued to ignore. So when I saw this smart city program launch, and I was there at the beginning of it, 
because of my involvement with having trying to create a city called Lavasa in the hills near Pune, uh, I found that the Prime Minister most exciting in saying that we have ignored urbanization for the last, we should have started our process 30, 40 years ago. We're very late. So we must move to what he called a Shahari Bharat. We can, you could say urban India, but in reality what he meant is not just a, a, a country of c villages, but a country of cities as well. And that, because we are so late, we need to smarten it up to leapfrog in <coughs> making, providing services to its citizens. <coughs> in this, he explained what is smart in his language. What he meant to say was, is where the, the management of the cities understand what is required to make the lives of citizens easier and better and provide it before they citizens ask for it. This was his definition of smart. And therefore, if you notice, the word smart does not have, it has all the attributes that are told, but it doesn't have a definition that every city that gets this money will go exactly in a given way, which is what Planning Commission would have done. What it says is you have to smarten up, you choose how you wish to move, what you wish to do. But what was achieved biggest here was that the conversation changed. We suddenly started talking about cities. We started feeling cities are where the new jobs will have to be created. Cities are where innovation will take place, research will take place. Yes, cities are also places where maximum pollution will take place, but then there are green solutions to do this. So fundamentally, what has been launched in the Smart Cities program is not just a conversation, a focus will now be on cities. In doing that, and then leaving it open for the smart, broadly which way to approach, left the cities. I think we have done very well. We have turned, and if you, when we are talking about it, even sometimes when we are mocking it, what is this smart city program, what is going on, we are still discussing cities. Go back, go back two years, we were never discussing cities. And that's one of the reasons my city got into difficulty with the government of India then, is because of these, these attitudes. There's also one more feature of India that creates a huge problem for cities with all these gentlemen when they talked of how much you can improve the city for giving better services, is that we are a democracy. We have a very well cut out idea of an, an institution called the central government or federal government. We have very good state governments that are there. And they all function in a federal setup quite effectively. Yet we do not have the last year of government, which is the local self-government. And wherever it exists, it is only notional. The mayors of this city are absolutely powerless. They are titular heads. And the power lies with the municipal commissioner who is appointed by the state government. So bad is the position of the mayor that after 9-11, when Mayor Giuliani went around the world giving a talk on, on the cities, the mayor of Bombay was not even invited to the talk in Mumbai. So that, is, that much was the whole thing. And so we did have a strong institution, at least in the big cities, of mayors. Mayor Gigi ba <coughs> uh, Kawaji Jangir of, of Bombay did not agree with India government of India's decision then to have an Indian standard time. So during his tenure as mayor, the Bombay's Crawford market showed Bombay standard time. Sure. So that was the power of a, of a mayor which was tolerated even though he was a native. And here is a mayor today which doesn't even get invited to a, a mayor's talk. So we have a serious problem here in creating a third tier of government which doesn't go back to the state government for deciding whether it should build a road, a bridge, a, a sewage treatment plant, etc. So with, on one side, the hopeful attitude of having launched the conversation and brought city to the center of our discussion and improvement, and the other side, a lacuna that much as we may want to do this, we will need to also create a structural change in our constitution in order to bring about improvement in the city.
So I'm really glad you brought up governance because <coughs> I noticed that governance was the one piece that was missing in, in the conversation before. To the non-Indians in the room, um, just to quickly explain this to you, urbanization is a state subject, not a subject that's mandated at the federal government. So what happens as a consequence is state chief ministers get to decide what gets done in cities. And so therefore, cities are seen mostly as revenue sources more than anything else, because political power does not rest in the cities. They're colonies. They're colonies, effectively. So Ajit is right. Uh, you know, Both of us are residents of Mumbai, but more than likely, neither of us knows even the name of the mayor of Mumbai. Um, perhaps you know Ajit. No, I, 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 get a, I get a WhatsApp from her. Oh, you get a WhatsApp. OK, so you know her name. I don't. Uh, but, but let me just push you on this issue for a second. The, the, the reason why mayors don't get power is because no state-level politician wants competition from below. That's the central problem. How are you going to convince a chief minister to actually give up power so that a city can actually manage itself? Because the problem is the day Mumbai has an empowered mayor, that person becomes the most important politician in Maharashtra. So the way Prince Bismarck stopped Octroy in Germany, he just did it one bright day. You pass this, pass a constitution. But who's your equivalent of the Prince Bismarck? You see, that's the well, problem. I, the way, way Prime Minister Modi has handled the Pakistan situation, I think you have a Prince Bismarck here. No, but he, does, he has no power because no, urban's a no, state no, subject. No, no, no. That is a constitutional amendment. Remember one thing. United States, the states came together to create a federal state. And they created the city, city governments too. India, the states were created by the union, mm -hmm. then made into a federal state. So the union government can still create the third tier of government and enforce it upon the states. Yes, it will not work fully well to begin with, but that's the only way it can go forward. And the 72nd and 73rd Amendment... 73 and 74. 73rd and 74th Amendment of the Constitution lays down this... It just did not lay down the calendar or a schedule to do it. Right. So they can push this in quickly. And I think if you start doing it now, you will, you will get that. Right. And I do not see how otherwise a urban development department of a state, which is usually by mostly led by chief minister, is ever going to do something to 200 towns and cities in Maharashtra or any other place. Sure. And the new ones that we will require. For Lavasa, biggest question is it's all private property. How are we going to govern it? Who's going to police it? Who's going right, to, right. to so, do so many things? We, so we'll, the, these we'll models are still to be created. And, and again, you know, people forget the fact that some of the great leaders of India, Pandit Nehru, Sardar Patel, were all mayors. That was their political base. That's how they came to power. And we've forgotten this history as well. So let me, let me just uh, go to you, Jagdish, because Mahindra has actually built smart cities. What's your experience been like? I mean, what's the positives? What's the negatives? What are the general takeaways out there for the company? Um, see, we, we started in this venture because we thought we had a few things to offer, and uh, including our knowledge of uh, you know, some of the work that we do on the housing, which we could probably bring towards affordable. But affordable, again, is a very... Yeah, you know, affordable, affordable to whom, whom is the question, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a question to ask. But you know, we all make our definitions and move forward. So our, I'll take a case in point. We've done some uh, a setup development in Chennai. So obviously for us, the makes, uh, this, what makes sense for us is to go further away from the city center and build it because then you can afford to get the land going. We can build the houses and put, put projects which are sort of, and our, for us it was important that we create the business center as well because our idea was that we will create livelihood for those people so that the living and the livelihood and life, the three things that matter, start to happen there. And the challenge therefore became how do we handle transportation or mobility? You know, um, And these are people, so we had to then work very closely and I don't think we are 100% successful, but this is about how you do things in India and probably how things need to be working in India is that uh, our people, our team started working with the railways. To, there's a nearby station to where we are how do we add more coaches to it? Because if you move people here and they have to go work in the city or center of Chennai and they don't get a place to stay, mm -hmm. you know, get inside the train, then it's not going to work out. Right. So the, to me, I think, the, though I would love to say technology, and we were having this debate before this, the technology from a Tech Mahindra perspective would solve all problems and we could transport it. 
But, but the, let, let me actually ask you that question because Ajit brought it up as well, which is the problem in the country is the lack of state capacity and especially on enforcement. So you can have all kinds of technological fixes, but there's no state capacity to actually enforce anything. Now, one could make the argument that technology could be a reasonable proxy for the missing state. Is that the way, for instance, you would see it? I mean, what role can technology play here? Well, um, I think it can play a very significant role, uh, especially in a lot of ways. Most of our challenges are that uh, um, you know we cannot afford to put more people on the street, though I think cost of people in, in this country is right. cheaper to police. But who's going to police them? Then you have another layer to police sure. them. So there's no end to that policing. So to me, I think technology is the only solution to keep monitoring and being able to use the data effectively. So we talked about garbage collection, for example. And if I, do, if I were to put sensors on those garbage collect uh, collecting vehicles, be able to tell whether the person actually visited it or not, and take action on the person, the challenge is who's going to take that action? Right. Whether you're going to get into a problem with the because union... Because technology can't action. solve that problem. Technology can't solve that problem. Technology can give you data, which is uh, effective decision-making, sure. but can't take the decision for you. Pratik, you had sort of hinted on this as well when you said technology as means, not end. Right. I mean, do you want to just speak to this issue as well? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I have uh, Mr. Jain sitting here, and, you know, Uber has brought technology. If the government had said that only black and yellow cabs will exist in India and nothing else, then the matter ends over there. Right. They created economic incentives, and therefore someone with a technological solution came and if five drivers turn out to be poor quality, someone will Uber, I'm sure, will lose his job. Sure. Who will lose their job if the garbage doesn't get collected in Mumbai? Who will lose their job if the broadband is bad? Who will lose their job if the electricity load shedding in Gurgaon is 10 hours? No one. So I have a, you know, I continue to say the same thing. Please bring economic incentives and competition in the delivery of basic utilities, as has been done in the US, as has it been done in the UK, as has been done for transport in India. Right. And uh, you mean aviation? No, Uber. Oh, Uber, Uber. okay. Uber yeah. transport, aviation. Okay. Even aviation. Even aviation. Yeah. You know, we, we did a small experiment in Mumbai. We said that broadband is really bad in Mumbai. What if I uh, um, connected 200,000 homes with a fiber optic network and offered that network to anyone to, subs to pump in broadband into that home and pay me a fee for it? That could create competition. I have eight subscribers, eight uh, internet service providers fighting with each other providing 50 gig, 100 meg connections in those homes, while the neighbor next door, like one neighborhood away who didn't have that service, depended on MTNL, is still getting two megs, and he's out two hours a day. Right. I believe we have enough incidences to show that competition solves the problem. We just need to bring it to basic utilities, and, and you're right, that comes down to who will make that decision. Yeah, it is right. the state government. Sure. It, is the, it is the municipal corporation. But we need that change in a constitution, something right. that will make Because you happen. need to unbundle and then privatize. Yes. I mean, no, yes. That's, yes. Maharashtra government does use technology. Right. Yes. They're committed to it. They put CCTVs in dance bars. Mm -hmm. For what reason? I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, Amit, um, so one of the central problems here is, is that the ability of regulation to keep up, as, and especially as technology sort of speeds up, right? The inability of regulation to keep up. And we've got former regulators in the room, and hopefully they'll come in on the discussion as well. Um, um, the economist Ajay Shah, he wrote a memorable piece about Uber once, about the fact that every regulator in India is obsessed about level playing fields. But you can get to level playing field either by pulling everybody down to mediocrity or pulling everybody up to excellence. And India, the response typically is to pull everybody down to mediocrity. And that's one of the problems that Uber itself has had to face. How do you view this regulatory conundrum where you, know, you are thinking up a scenario where, when the regulators are dealing with problems of yesterday? Yes, let me, let me address that in two parts, Ruben. The first part is kind of your point about technology and the pace of regulations. Uh, you know, in most cases, technology will always be at a higher pace uh, than regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's always been the case uh, for decades, for centuries. I'll give you an example, right? If you talk about when cars were first invented about 100 years back, the regulations at that time were that in front of a car, there's got to be a person walking with a flag 
<laughs> to protect the horse and carriage industry. Right, right. Those seem smart regulations at that time. Obviously, that didn't last for very long. Uh, as we look at our space as well, as we look at Uber in India, Uber across some of the other countries, uh, you know, in most countries, uh, in fact, in all countries, regulations is, uh, is following uh, the innovation in technology. The innovation in technology will not stop. I think it's up to all companies like us and others, how do you bring regulators along? And how do you bring regulators along in a way that shows the benefit, in our case, again, to riders, to drivers, and to cities? Um, it's not a short path. It's not an easy path, but that's the only way to get there. To wait for regulations to change before innovation happens is a much longer time period than making the change happen and bringing regulators along in a, in a relatively shorter time span because something has happened that shows the benefits uh, you know, to a section of society. Uh, I think that was the first question. So I can repeat your second question again? Or the no, second part no. of the question? I mean, it, it was more a question of you know, the level playing field argument that regulators constantly use. Yeah. Yeah, so, think, so, you know, so therefore there is a Kali Peeli taxi, so I won't let me now bring you down to the level of the Kali Peeli. Yeah. What, what the instinct is to bring down rather than take up. Yeah, I think you couldn't have said that better, right? And again, it is, and, and as, as we work with regulators, it is how do you create a level field, but not by imposing 10 extra conditions, right? How do you deregulate to the most extent, uh, you know, industry so that it benefits everybody? I mean, take New York, for example, we had, a, you know, we had a medallion system where there was an artificial supply cap right. because a medallion costs a million dollars. So the number of cabs on the road that were in New York City uh, today versus 40 years back was the same, was exactly the same because of the medallion system. Since Uber there, the cost of the medallion has come, back, has come down by three-fourths, if not more. Similar here, right? our conversation with the government and our urge to the government is, you know, let's not put onerous regulations that might have existed before. Let's deregulate and let's everybody. make it a level playing field for everybody. So if you've got five regulations on, on supply caps, on, on price restrictions, on other areas that have not benefited or that are hurdles to the transportation industry today, how do you remove those barriers from, CCT, uh, from, uh, uh, from the yellow I'm, I'm curious, well? what's the pushback? It's not about pushback. It's about taking time to get different uh, kind of regulators Stakeholders. There. I mean, Stakeholders, right? Transportation, in our case, and you talked about this, is a state subject. Yep. Uh, so kind of there's one way, which is you know, let's work with the central government to change the, to amend the Constitution, to amend the Motor Vehicles Act. At the same time, work with state regulators to say, OK, in the meantime, because transport is a state subject, let's amend that. Mm -hmm. So it's more about pushback. It's about how do you get everybody on the same page? How do you get everybody on the same page that let's put some you know, political instincts to the side? Is this better for our cities? Is this what is needed for our cities? Is this better for our riders? Is this going to reduce congestion and pollution? Is this going to make transportation easier? Yeah. And you'll have various people who will come on that argument day one. There'll be other people who will take longer time. It's, uh, it's human nature. So while I have you on the spot, yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about what are you guys doing at the cutting edge? And I don't mean in India. You know, the last time I had a conversation with somebody at Uber, they were talking to me about autonomous flying vehicles. What, what's, the, what's the bleeding edge for Uber right now? See, what are you guys thinking up? See, autonomous is happening in the US, right? But cutting edge, right? To me, cutting edge in India is as basic as ride sharing in India. That is cutting edge in India today. Again. I'll go back to our Delhi example, right? 70% of the cars in the road in Delhi today have one passenger in the car. Right. We could, if you could change that tomorrow and say, regulations allow ride sharing. Regulations allow somebody from going from their home to work to pick up another passenger on the way, and you've done all the necessary background checks, safety precautions, et cetera. Can we reduce the number of cars on the road by 30%, 35% tomorrow? Okay. So, it, it, it's, it doesn't sound as fancy as autonomous, which is something we're doing in the US, but that is more than cutting edge today in what our, in what our cities need today. It's absolutely cutting edge. Okay. Um, Ajit, on the governance issue again, going back to it, I mean, in, with Lavasa, you've had some experience with this. One way to think about smart cities is there is an SPV now in place through which you could actually try some experiments. So for instance, you actually have an empowered <coughs> CEO with a fixed term of five years as opposed to a mayoral term of... So do you, do you, what, what's your view on that? Using the smart city 
uh, as a vehicle for experimentation. Yeah. See, we are in a very peculiar situation. We are up in the hills. Uh, we are dealing with 18 villages yeah. and some group panchayats who have benefited so much by this development coming that they have they cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you create a management out of it, uh, a, a managing city out of it, in terms of uh, how who will decide what is good for the city? Should it be the people that live there will vote and do it? How much of that should be vote? How much of that should be still managed privately with a contract? And then over a period of time, it will shift to like an, any normal city. These are issues that have still not begun any kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. I've started this dialogue with Delhi, in, the, in Delhi with them, that if you're going to build 100 new cities, you have this city already under construction. Why don't we look at the governing mo governance model for this? Because you, every day there is this problem. What is this? How do you provide security? One is provide private security. But then who will, who will actually make an arrest? Right. Who will? The way we have governed is so poor in the country that when we asked for, a, for policemen to come there, after, they sent us after six weeks two policemen. Hmm. So this kind of a thing, this is how they govern. This is how it is always happening. So you don't realize, when you really now see a larger population living here requires policing, that's when you, this whole thing comes home to you. Now, these are things that need to be sorted. How much of this is a sovereign function that can be contracted out? For example, a lot of municipal functions can be contracted out. Sure, but enforcement is very hard to... Enforcement is yeah. very hard. Giving death certificates is very hard yeah. because you have to have crematoriums and burial grounds and everything in such a place. So there are many such issues that are there that are still waiting, and we have now raised this point that this needs to be tackled side by side too. The other side of the governance is that because there is no model of leaving the city to, to deal with it itself, the state government officials don't understand what you're asking. As he said, these are new things we are doing. So we have to come up with new ideas to convince them how it helps. But do you have a model in mind for enforcement on the specific question we, of enforcement? We have, no, we have several ideas in mind and they have to be discussed with everybody. Only thing we know is that the Indian constitution allows private cities to be run and a public-private partnership is allowed. Jamshedpur for a while was run like that. Correct. So I think there is a possibility of doing it, but nobody has seriously, because city is not important, city right. has to be right. controlled. Right. So it hasn't been done, you know. It's a, it's, a, it's a painful process of pointing out to them how this will help, how they themselves want more cities built, how this will right. be a model. This is there, it's called machete technology. Right. You know, the guys who go ahead right, in right, a right. jungle cutting out the first guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll leave that for the audience to ask you further <laughs> questions on. Um, Pratik, um, energy, right? Yeah. I mean, urban's going to be the single largest consumer of electricity energy going forwards. Yeah. Given all the concerns around sustainability and so on, how are you thinking about the whole issue of how does one bring down the per capita carbon footprint of urban residents, besides the obvious, but as a, as a utility, sure. how do you think about it? I mean, obviously, Amit mentioned the transportation part of it, but yeah. as an energy producer, as an yeah. energy company, how do you think about it? So there, I, I look at it in two ways. There is the <laughs> delivery aspect of it, who will deliver energy, and then there is technology. I think technology has been covered in, in various forums uh, yesterday, but I'll just quickly you know, c cover it once again. Uh, the combination of rooftop solar with storage, along with a smart grid, is going to take over urban in most of urban world, whether it's five years, 10 years, whatever. Uh, if you, any of you have been reading about what's happening in Hawaii right now, there is a major pushback because there is so much rooftop solar that people don't need the grid anymore. And this is without storage. Imagine what happens if there's storage and they can use it at night as well. They will simply surrender the grid and you've got the entire grid wondering what do I do with myself as well as my generation. So I'm just curious, in Hawaii, how does the uh, base load work? I mean, uh, so what do they do without the storage if it's all solar? No, so they're using it in the day at the moment and uh -huh. at night they're dependent on the grid. Oh, so the grid is still... Okay. Yeah, yeah, at night. So my point is that technology is going to come, you don't need anything, no one needs to do anything right now, just wait for it to come. How does it and, and the technology, and of course, that will solve the 
38,000, I think, megawatts of diesel generators in our country, which contribute to carbon footprint. Uh, I, I'm, I think that that should solve a large part of it. But you still have, and you talk about enforcement, right? So who, when you say enforcement, maybe you'll ask a question that who's going to enforce that there is no load shedding in Gurgaon? It's not just load shedding. It's much more than that. I mean, right. the guy who comes and destroys your electricity sure. meter, then asks a 20,000 bribe to reinstall your electricity sure. meter. Agreed. Agreed. So if, if, if the customer's satisfaction is important to one or two agencies, then that is when you remove that problem. No one cares about customer satisfaction right. because the municipal commissioner, okay, or whatever of Gurgaon or Mumbai, that's not his KRA or KPI. He doesn't right. get his dividends from that. Right. So I come back to the same thing. It's been done around the world. Unbundle the last mile. There is a bill in the parliament right now for content and carriage separation. Right. It requires a lot of political will as much as the GST. Right. But if they can get that through, then you can have hundreds of supply licenses mom and pop shops who are procuring one, two, three megawatts of power and supplying to small communities around the country and competing with each other. So then, yeah. They're implementing time of day use. They're saying that, okay, you know, I'm not just gonna supply it to you, but if you have a lot of extra power because you have a large roof, I will give you the best price for it, better than him. And Got I will it. take that from you and give it to this textile mill outside the city. Got it. So I think, it's, I think it goes hand in hand, environment and energy and, go, and this contractual method, all three together uh, can definitely solve that problem. Okay. Um, audience, I'm coming to you. This is my last question before I come to you, so get your questions ready. Um, Jagdish, um, Mahindra has actually been at the forefront of uh, affordable housing in general. I mean, and this is such a crucial element of cities, and it doesn't really get talked about, the fact that, you know, it's, it's about migrant workers coming into cities and housing them. Um, what's your, I mean, what are the takeaways? I mean, if you had, I mean, in the provision of affordable housing, what stands in the way? Uh, financing. Uh, financing from whom? Financing to the to people. The, and so the, okay. Yeah. The, okay. So I think the, if there's one area that I think needs to be seriously looked at, we've done some work because we have a financing arm of sure. our own which does rural financing, so they understand how do you do little bit of microfinance and figure that out. Just but out of curiosity, do you do non-collateralized or collateralized? Collateralized. Collateralized. Right? Okay. So which is the bigger challenge, course, right? So you need to move to a lot more non-collateralized sure. based on data, data and transactions. Yeah. And I'm hoping with the uptake of payment banks, with the uptake of being able to move from digital to, uh, sorry, from cash to digital, we'll collect a whole lot of data, which countries like Philippines, et cetera, have done, by the way. Right. And they're able to figure out from your telephone conversations, from your social media presence, whether they can do collateral, non-collateral based loans. Right. So what we've done is to a certain extent, and I don't think we've been 100% successful, is to be able to bring these financing players to come and work with these affordable housing. Because again, as I said, affordable to us is non-affordable yeah. to a lot of people. And therefore, how do I make that loan and that payment mechanism available for the guy to be able to afford that? So that right. to me is the biggest challenge for, we can build 15 lakh, 20 lakh house, yeah, houses, sure. but how do we get them there? Um, Ajit, you yeah. wanted to come, but specifically if either of you could also address the issue of approvals. <laughs> no, because I, you know, if you've got a high capital cost no, and I, approvals take 24 months. That is, that is one part. But first of all, I, I have a slightly different take on the affordable housing. Okay. When you use the word affordable housing, you have to provide a concrete home to somebody it is going to always have the question of what is really affordable. Affordable housing is only real affordable housing is rental housing. Agree. So when you have large, large floor space indices, which will then produce apartments and tenements that can be rented out at cheap rates, that's the only affordable. Because at, at that stage of life, nobody wants to actually buy a house. I agree. He wants to today live there. And nowadays, he may even not be permanently living there and decides to buy a house a little later when he, he can afford it better. At which stage, the lowest entry, entry housing uh, uh, value uh, prices can come into question. But this is very important. Now, today in Bombay, when you go back to Ballard Estate and all the buildings in Bombay, if you see before 1950 50 or 55, so awesome. everybody except the very rich lived in rental housing, from chief executives of companies down to labor. But, but so, Ajit, so, the problem so, is the rental yield right now is less than 2%. No, but that is because you take it. Now, if you see most buildings in Bombay were four or five stories. And if you see the footprint of that building is the same as the floor size. Right. 
Now, if that F floor space index at that time was five, today to make it affordable, the floor space index at least should be 10, 15, right. in order to create a, 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 the number of floors so that you can create apartments that can be given out at cheaper rent. What is it? Your slums right. are nothing but, but rental, rental housing. housing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, on that note, go to the audience. Uh, can I, Sandeep, can I just put you on the spot? So just on this call, in yeah. Lavasa, when we tackled the problem, we found that we have to create a large area of what we call rental housing or social housing, Got which it. is available from uh, 300 rupees a month rent to 3,000. So 3, dormitory housing? Yeah. Okay. So dormitory to this okay. all kind, yeah. So can I put you on this? So Sandeep Parikh here is a former regulator. So if you can just come in on the question of regulation and technology, and then I'll open it out. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I can see you put me on the spot because I slight tweeted you yesterday. <laughs> uh, I think you raised a very important point on why, why regulators behave the way they do. And I think there are at least three forces which come immediately to mind. <clears throat> Uh, one is, of course, a political force, you know, the Uber model, you have right. auto guys, so th they have more votes than the people, the consumers, so <clears throat> that's kind of a political problem. Um, the second really is, uh, apathy is always a, a, a regulator's best friend, because if you don't do anything, if you don't sure. build the metro, there, there won't be any questions asked. There's a lot of safety in the status quo. Uh, right. And we've, we've seen, seen that with SEBI, you know, so many CBI inquiries after, uh, SEBI, SEBI officers. Right, it's all downside, there's no upside. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, really the last point is this, I guess, uh, accountability, which I think you addressed already in terms of there's really no accountability because of the structure we have in of, of large cities, which are not supposed to be this large. Um, so I think these, these are the three kind of key forces which uh, are impediments to regulators and even governments, municipalities is becoming accountable, accountable. Uh, governance issues, etc. Okay. I saw a hand up there. Uh, if you could just introduce yourself and keep it short because we're out, we're really running out of time quickly. So I'm Rajat from Hero Motor Corp. Yeah. Uh, I think the issues with Indian cities is the money that gets raised from the cities doesn't get spent in cities, sure. right? But that's Mumbai political, problem. yes. And the second is a lot of things are already hardwired. Like most Indian cities have 5% space for roads. Manhattan is 25%. So 30%, yeah. What is the way around it? I think 10, 15 years back, and probably Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu was thinking that he would set up, as you know, in China, Beijing and other cities are run like states. So the idea was to create at that time new Hyderabad, which would be run like a city state. Raise money there, spend there, and you start from scratch. In fact, one of the reasons why Delhi had so much of infrastructure development was because once it became a sure. state, the money got spent. He was the mayor, yeah. He was the mayor. So I think the, probably it's time now to revive some of those because otherwise if you try to make smart cities around the current cities where already a lot of degrees of freedom are not there, we won't go anywhere. And but second, the money has to be spent, which but is... But the spent. problem is what we I raised think, earlier, you know, right? Which is, how do you create the incentives? No, no, creating a city-state is not required. Whole of United States, New York, New York is part of New York State, and Albany is its capital. So you can have big cities that are run. The independence to the cities to run themselves, as well as to raise revenue and keep the revenue there, is more important. And Delhi is a state is a fiction. It's union territory. So a lot of money which is, which is spent is central government money on this city. So it's a union territory. It's, it's a very nice facade. It's called a state. That's what Kejriwal is finding out. It is not really a state. The issue is really giving them the independence to run. And I think that is lacking in the very idea of understanding it. So how can you let the, the city run by itself? Like the state is allowed to be run by itself. It's something that they're yet not catching traction. OK. Why don't we take two questions together, you here and the gentleman there. If you can just ask your question. If you can just introduce yourself in a brief comment. Yeah, I'm Nitin Natrale from KPMG. I had a question actually for Mr. Gulabshan. Um, you know, we've talked about there is no definition of smart city. It is, you know, what is relevant. Where do the residents come into this? You know, where, where is their input? And where, where are we building that expectation in terms of what that city must be or what it should look so like? So cities are about people, not about the right. infrastructure. Because it seems to be very top-down. must top have down. independence, no? Yeah. The city must have independence. 
Uh, we'll just take his question as well, and I'll let you answer the question. Yes, Because uh, if we say we are a democracy, it is government of the people, by the people, for themselves. So their own capacity to take care of themselves, actually, and, and ensure that community policing, self-policing, self-discipline, you throw a banana peel on the road and blame the municipality, I mean, that kind of culture, I think clearly it is not sustainable. So somewhere we're building these models of smart city and functional cities and good cities. This element has to be captured, uh, the government of the people, by themselves and for themselves. And whatever else yeah. is needed to be done for that, this, I think yeah. Mr. Gulab uh, uh, brought that in. I think uh, that has to be the focus. Yeah. See, if you create cities and there is a mayor and there are people there, you're bringing governance closer to the citizen. I'll give you one example which tells you how it becomes uh, important. I have invited many politicians around the world, from prime ministers down to come and visit Lavasa. Every other prime, uh, politician quickly promised to do so, except the mayors, who said, I will have to see, justify my visit to Lopez. Because every day he's out of the city, he has to answer. Next day he's walking on the street, he was asked, where did you go? You're having a jaunt. So the accountability also comes when the city is managed, because the citizen becomes closer to the management of the city. And that's where these issues come, where the citizen starts having a bigger say in doing things. Today it is so remote. Does anyone else have a view on what the questions that were asked? Uh, Amit, do you want to quickly respond to what uh, Sandeep had mentioned on the regulation piece? Or? No, thank you. OK. Um, any more questions? Yes, please. If you can keep it brief, it would be great. I'll try my best. Uh, so it's very simple. Next time we have a panel discussion like this, I would recommend we have somebody from the government also sitting there. Is there anybody that was, here? That was room? recommendation number one. Yeah, so so I think that then it'll be, uh, uh, I would say, a, a lesser intellectual time pass. I mean, because we needed to have their uh, point of view. Second, yeah, but what makes you think the government sitting on a panel like this will actually be honest with you? No, that's not the point. The point is fundamental. The point is that India, India's politicians get their votes from villages. Okay, that's where the money comes in from. So 200 cities in the last they, election cycle were urban. Yes. Yeah. 200 but when you, when so you they will not win on urban, but they lose on they urban. They will lose no, no, on no. urban. But when you look at a volume to volume, I don't think there is a debate where the votes comes from. No, but you can You'd be surprised by the work. kind of research going on right now that actually it's goes urban. into the classification story. Yes. Uh, but that may be a trend. But as on today, when you do We're a volume to volume. on today. As there's on today. World Bank studies that there are agglomeration indices. There's all kinds of work being done today. No, no, okay. Right. So basically the it's point changing. is. changing. Yeah, it is changing. Like I said, it's a trend. So my point is that it is important for us. This wonderful discussion needs to find its voice Absolutely. and be heard and not just be heard, but acted on. That was my comment. I'll tell you, somebody like Amitabh Kant, who, like me, was trying to create cities along the, the north, DMIC, the, yeah. the, the, the DMIC. Part of his freight corridor, is a great exponent of making this happen. And every platform of government, he, he has the biggest task of convincing his colleagues that this is necessary. So you do have some good exponents of this philosophy of allowing cities to be governed by themselves within the government. The thing is, it's not a small job, task to convince India to do things. I understand. It's just learning from other people. I mean, if you look at South America, for instance, most of the nations over there have similar policy situations. You should learn and take a clue from there. The, the difference is the is difference it. of power structure in Latin America is different. Is, Anyone else want to comment on I just, uh, I don't think this is about, personally, I, I don't think this has got anything to do with cities. I think the whole point of getting, what are, what are cities? Cities with more than X lakh population, a place with more than X lakh population is called a city. It doesn't mean a city has better infrastructure than a village in UP. I think this distinction of city and village has to go away in the next five years is meaningless. You get electricity, water, broadband, transport, and environment to any place in the world, it could be a person with 10 families in the middle of uh, Uttaranchal, that is a better place to live than Mumbai. Exactly. So, At the same time, where there are theatres, where there's cinema, where there are restaurants, where there are other entertainment places, where there are libraries, where all this also constitutes a city which is not there in a village. So 
but with provision for cattle in basement two, three, and four. They have their own radio stations as well. <laughs> so that is a smart village. It's a smart city. It is a smart village, whatever it's definition. Tiny, tiny I, th I think, uh, you know, just to uh, conclude yeah, this, here, there's probably there's two there's key there. messages that we're probably hearing. And to the point that we're saying, one, I think, as a message of saying, break it down, make it privatized, I think that's a conversation that needs to on be... The, on the no, no. services side. On, on the, the services side. side. Yeah. Yeah. And make it available so that there's, you know, I think you made that point that, you know, if you make it competitive and you make it privatized, I think you'll get a lot of uh, good uh, uh, so progress on this. Is, yeah. and, and I think the second most important point, which is true for everything we do, uh, is accountability. Who is accountable? And that, if that happens, I think technology can make that rest of the solutions happen. So these are probably two things. Any more questions? OK, I was basically asked to sum up in five minutes what we heard during this panel. But I think I'll sum it up with just one line, which is we need to move the discussion away from smart cities to doing smart things in cities. Right. And with that, we'll end this. It's a miracle in India. We've actually ended ahead of time. So thank you very much, panelists. Thank you, audience, for showing up. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.